What's up guys, it's Dorian. I put together a list of must-have Linux apps that I figured you guys might find interesting. These are all packages that I install whenever I have a new system up and running and I want my usual stuff that I use on a daily basis. So I'm going to start with Redshift slash The Nightlight. Now in GNOME, this is built in. You just run to your control panel, devices, displays, and you'll have a nightlight option at the bottom. This is on the newer version of GNOME. What this does is called blue shifting. So it makes the display easier on the eyes when it's dark out. It takes a lot of the harsh blue light out and makes it a nice warm color. At first you might find it looks funny, but your eyes do get used to it very quickly. If you're running a distro that doesn't have nightlight built in, there's a package called Redshift that you could download and it essentially does the same thing. And it puts this light bulb icon in your system tray. Next up, we have Tweak Tool, which should really be included in any GNOME distro. If not, you can install it. This lets you change the window decorations. It lets you change the shell theme. It lets you change your icon theme. And all these can be downloaded from websites like GNOME Look. It'll also change all your application shortcuts to match the theme. Tweak Tools also lets you add icons to your desktop if you so prefer, and it also lets you manage your extensions. Now, managing your extensions is something I did another video on, and I'll link it up in the top here. Other things are fonts, keyboard and mouse, power options, startup applications, different tweaks with the title bar. And one important thing that I always set here is the middle click button. I always set it to minimize. So when you middle click with the mouse on a window bar, it will minimize it. So that's just one little shortcut that I like to do. And it also lets you manually manage your workspaces. And now Tweak Tools is also available in elementary because it's based on GNOME, but this is elementary tweaks. It's very similar and it's something that you'll probably want if you've never used elementary. You could do the same thing, change your themes and whatnot. But one of the important things is the layout option here. Now this lets you change where the close, minimize, maximize buttons are in the window because by default, the close button is on the left. And that's very Unity Mac-ish. It's total preference. I wish this was an option by default, but you need to install the elementary tweak tools if you want to be able to manage where these buttons are on your windows. Another option I find handy under files is the ability to disable single click. This changes the file manager behavior from single click to double click, which is the standard. Next up is Meow. I've covered Meow in its own video. I'll put a link in the description here, but this is something that I always install on all my GNOME distributions because the applications menu can be a little crowded, a little messy when you have a lot of things installed. There's a lot of software you can put on a system and because GNOME doesn't use folders and by default you can't organize it, Meow allows you to create, for example, an office folder and put LibreOffice in it. The next must have app is Genie. This is an editor that I use for Python. It's not limited to Python, it can do bash, it could do all kinds of other languages and it will color them and autocomplete them. And it also has a handy left bar here so you can kind of use them as shortcuts to skip to your different functions and definitions. Now this isn't as powerful as say PyCharm, but it does basic auto completion and you can even execute your scripts. There are a lot of handy editing features such as commenting and indenting that is handy and it makes for a really great lightweight editor. Next up is Quake, named after the popular video game Quake, which had a drop down menu. When you hit F12, it brings down this pop down menu of the terminal. Now it's always running in the background. So the great thing about it is you can run a command, hit F12 again to hide it. And when you hit F12 again to bring it back, it's still there. So running a long command can be run in the background and not take up any space on your desktop. Next is the definite must have LibreOffice. Now this is the entire suite, which is not only Writer, but also other things like Calc, which is the LibreOffice version of Microsoft Excel. This opens, edits, and saves all Microsoft Office formats. The great thing about this is it's free and it works with all Office formats. The past few years have brought a huge improvement in document rendering, where years ago, if you had Microsoft Word and LibreOffice Writer side by side, you could see a lot of differences. Nowadays, the rendering has improved substantially and it's very hard to tell one from the other. 
I also mentioned OpenOffice because they both come from the same initial code base. The advantage of LibreOffice, however, is in the licensing. This is because new code for new improvements and features in OpenOffice can be integrated into LibreOffice. However, LibreOffice code cannot be integrated into OpenOffice. This means LibreOffice benefits from improvements from both pieces of software. One difference that I had someone point out to me one day is that LibreOffice doesn't have the up and down arrows on either end of the scroll bar, and OpenOffice does. However, the trick is here that LibreOffice has invisible arrow buttons. So if you click just outside of the scroll bar, you're clicking the invisible arrows. Next up is HaruPad. HaruPad has not been updated in a while, but it still works perfectly. It's a markdown editor. This is something handy and lightweight to jot down notes using simple markdown code. It does take maybe a little bit of getting used to, but it's definitely something that you can use. There's all kinds of different formattings. You can do lists, you can do numbered lists, and you can even do tables. The great thing about HaruPad is there's a little button you can click in the corner that shows you a cheat sheet on what the different formats are. This cheat sheet is also clickable, which means it'll fill it out for you, and then you can just type away. Next up is a must have if you're a distro hopper or you like to experiment with operating systems. It's VirtualBox. I'm sure many people have tried it. It's very easy to set up and it allows you to run operating systems within your system. Now this means that your host system, the machine that is running your operating system will not be affected by what you do inside the virtual machine. You can install an operating system, you can mess it up, you can even break it completely, and it's not gonna affect your real system. So this is great if you want to experiment or try new things and not worry about what's gonna happen. When you're done with it, you can literally just shut it off, delete it, and then create a new one. And you can do this as many times as you want, as long as you have hard drive space. Next up is Gparted and the KDE Partition Manager. These two pieces of software are very similar. They're cousins, I guess you could say. One runs on GNOME, one runs on KDE, but you can run them on each other. This is something that I will always run and I will always use because it's a nice graphical way of viewing your hard disk and managing it. It's a great way to add, remove, resize, and move your partitions, especially for someone like me who has several distributions on one hard drive. It's simply a matter of right-clicking, resizing, and then dragging it around. Of course, you can also do this in the terminal, but this is just something graphical that's easier to use for a lot of people. The next must have is GIMP. Of course, GIMP has been around for a very long time. It's a nice graphical image manipulation program and it's free and it's the closest thing you're going to get to Photoshop for free. Now the new version looks great. However, if you're like me, you don't like the monochrome icons on the newest version. You can go into the preferences and go to the icon theme and change it to how they used to look before. You can also change the entire theme from the dark back to the light, but the dark is actually really good on the eyes. Next is VLC. It has also been around for a very long time, just like GIMP. It plays pretty much any video format out of the box, one thing a lot of people don't know about is it can also convert video formats. Simply go to Media, Convert Save, add your files, click Convert Save, and then choose your media format and where you want to save the file. And VLC will re-encode it to whatever format you choose. Next along the lines of video and editing is KDN Live or KDE and Live. This is a video editor that I use all the time for all of my videos. It's fantastic. The latest versions are quite stable. They weren't so stable before. It has a good amount of effects. The learning curve is not too, too bad. It's a lot of drag and drop. So it's something that you can easily figure out within a couple of hours. I only started using it exclusively a few months ago when the stability improved dramatically. However, before that I was using Blender. Blender is a must have, especially if you like to play with 3D imaging but a lot of people don't realize that it's not only a 3D editor. As I said, I used to use this to edit my videos. Now the learning curve on using Blender to edit videos is much, much steeper, but you can do the same kind of editing in Blender that you can do in KDE. Next is Audacity. Audacity is a simple audio editor 
which can be as complicated as you want. If you've ever used Gold Wave back in the day, uh, it's very, very sim similar to that. You can edit, trim, add effects and whatnot. I'm not gonna get into it too much because it is a very simple program to use and is great for doing simple and quick edits. Next up is OBS, which is what I use to screen capture my videos. It's pretty easy to use, it's fairly powerful, and it's something that you don't have to read a lot of documentation to figure out. It's got your zoom effects, you can add images, you can add videos to it, such as this. And the only real settings you have to worry about is in your stream and output settings. Once those are set, you're pretty much done. After that, it's just a matter of setting up your audio input and setting up all your scenes and your sources, and you're on your way to recording your own videos. Next up is Play on Linux, which is a front end and manager to install software under Wine, which lets you run Windows applications in Linux, such as Photoshop. So let's be honest here, there are some pieces of software that are not available in Linux that you must run through Wine. Play on Linux does a lot of the work for you by setting up all the configurations and installing all the required pieces of software within Wine in the background for you. While I do love open source software, there are some things that just can't be done with it. For example, I use Photoshop because GIMP doesn't have the ability to do text effects, at least not on the fly. You have to do it all manually. The benefit of me using Photoshop, for example, is I can set all my effects to the text and it's not a permanent change. I can still modify them, tweak them and change them. And in fact, I can move them and I can even edit the text after the effects have been applied. So sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. And last but not least, Steam. Steam has a great collection of Linux games that is constantly growing and I'm hoping that there are more and more every single day and that the AAA titles start to realize that Linux is definitely viable platform for gaming. Now, one of the great things about Steam, if you're running an Optimus system like I am, where the NVIDIA and Intel GPUs work together, there is an option if you right click on your game and go to properties, you can click on set launch options and then just type in Opterun percent command percent. And then now when you run the game, it's going to run it under your NVIDIA card. Quick little trick for NVIDIA Optimus users. So that's my list of must have Linux apps. You can actually see here that I have most of them pinned all the time. And of course, there are some other notable mentions which I did not bring up, such as Geary, which is a great email client, and Timeshift, which is a fantastic backup utility. So my question is, is your must-have Linux apps list similar to mine? What other applications didn't I mention that you think are must-have? And are there any alternatives to the ones that I mentioned that you think are better, and why? Hit me up in the comments and let me know. Also, don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. I'd like to give a special thanks to my patrons, Carl Schneider, George Maris, Matt Hartley, Kit Waltz, and Says. You guys are my producers for this channel. Thank you so much for your contributions. If you would like to help support this channel, head on over to patreon.com slash dorian.slash. The link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Until next time, bash on.